Hi, and welcome to the show. This is the Ask Clever Over Coffee, How AI Built This with John Marino, which is me. And my co-host today is Chat GPT, and the voice is Billy Darkenwald. Hi. And today we are talking all things AI, and our special guest today is Nick Roseth. Hey, Nick. Hey, John. He is the chief explorer of Explore Design. Thanks for having me, John. Excited. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So a little bit about the show first before we get into it is the format is really about bringing people into the conversation of AI and how AI is shaping all of our lives. And with that, today's guest, Nick, is about talking about exactly the pros and cons of AI, what other people are seeing, what he's seeing in the tech world, where the technology is going, and probably a few little uh, secret bombs of what's going to happen as we move forward here. But we're going to dive into it all, and we appreciate you joining the conversation and watching us on YouTube or any of the uh, podcast platforms. So thank you. So let's get into it. Uh, Nick, why don't you start off by telling us just a little bit of background about your professional, uh, what you've been doing, and what you led up to here. Absolutely. I wanted to say first, I'm very excited to meet ChatGPT in person. It's very exciting. <laughs> it's very rare. It, very it rare. is, yes. Uh, I've been waiting a long time. Um, so my background, I've got about 25 years uh, in the tech space. Um, I've done uh, a number of different startups. I've worn many hats across the board. Um, in 2016, I did a, a film about the Minnesota uh, tech entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, that kind of led me down uh, the path that I'm at today. And about five years ago in 2018, um, I left uh, my regular job and uh, started Explore Design to work with companies on exploring the latest uh, innovation and emerging technologies out there, everything from startups to Fortune 500. And most recently, I've been spending most of my time in uh, finance uh, in the healthcare space. Okay. And so congrats on owning your own company. Thank you. That can be scary <laughs> in itself. Yes, indeed. So how was the leap for you from going from, you know, working for someone to, you know, doing your own thing? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, I had this opportunity come up when I so when I did my uh, film, uh, I had somebody reach out from Los Angeles that was uh, part of a startup and they were getting into the augmented reality space. And so that was kind of my introduction into uh, XR, uh, extended reality, which is the, the kind of one of the places that I spend a lot of my time lately. And so he showed me my film on the uh, on a Microsoft HoloLens on the wall of a coffee shop. And I kind of fell in love with uh, the concept of XR and just all of the, um, you know, computer vision and, uh, and all of that. And so uh, then he texts me a few weeks later and says, hey, I need some developers. And I said, well, what are you building? And he said, well, I don't know yet. And so I said, um, well, I could probably help you out with some, some product stuff. And so um, I went out on my own and essentially signed them up as my first client. And so spent a couple of years doing um, XR in construction. Uh, and so augment, if you think about you know, this building that we're in right now, you put on a Microsoft HoloLens, which is augmented reality, and essentially project holograms in front of you. And that shows all of the uh, plumbing, mechanical, electrical framing um, so that you can in a brand new pour, uh, concrete poured building, you'd be able to see everything before it exists. Interesting. And then when you're building it, then you would actually be able to do quality control to make it sure all the studs are in the right places. Right. Um, in commercial construction, I think the estimate is 20% of it goes to waste, which is crazy. And so if you can walk through a building as it's being built, spot problems before they happen, and before they happen on 40 stories, ideally, um, then, uh, then, you know, that could be super valuable. So XR and construction is one of those. And of course that integrates a lot of visual technologies like augmented reality. Um, but it's all driven largely by computer vision and AI, which, um, uses machine learning to be able to recognize objects, to be able to do spatial mapping. And so now things like the uh, Apple Vision Pro, you know, there's so much AI built into that thing, it's crazy. That's kind of how I got started in this space. So I've been in XR for probably about five or six years now, and then working with multiple clients on exploring 
both how spatial computing can apply to industries, um, like, you know, healthcare is a big one, uh, manufacturing. I'm also the uh, president of the VRARA, the Virtual Reality Augmented Reality Association, um, which is a global network. So we do events um, and we talk about um, the integration of AI, yeah. XR, yeah, yeah. spatial computing, of course, the, uh, the Apple Vision Pro, the entire industry has been yeah. waiting 10 years for this thing to launch. So it's been super exciting lately. And so a lot of what I do from a consulting perspective is I go out and explore these emerging technologies and understand them as best I can, but then also talk about how do people and enterprises integrate these into their businesses, sure. into the culture, what are some of the ramifications, Yep. and then also doing a lot of that work in the LLM space, large language models. Got it. So chat GPT, um, working with a couple of clients on how do we plug our private data into uh, a large language model and get business value off of it. Got it. So that's a bit of what I do. So for me, like, you know, I wear glasses, you're wearing glasses. And when the first, you know, XR vision thing I can think of, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that I could think of is the Google lens, the Google glasses. Google glass, yep. yep. <laughs> and I found it frustrating because I wear glasses and I don't wear contacts, so I couldn't really use them. Sure. Was that your first, like, what was your first experience, like, trying those on? You know, I, I think I tried them on once, um, and I wear glasses too. Right. So... Um, I think Google Glass was ahead of its time for sure. I mean, there's- Why do you say that? Because culture wasn't ready to kind of have this onboard compute, you know, the whole time. So I think, you know, and we'll talk about this with AI, but I think technology in general is, it's about timing. Um, it really and, is. And so how do you align with, you know, the right generation with the right time? Now in construction, you could take a Microsoft HoloLens and it very clearly, like when I, Put it on. I was like, this is the future of construction, 100%. Sure. But you go put that on to a foreman's head in their 50s yep. that's been doing it one way their entire life and ask them to try to change something is very difficult. Of course. So I think society has to be ready for it. And we're kind of in this generational shift right now um, with, you know, Apple, of course, coming into the market with the concept of spatial computing really is this mixture of XR and AI. Yeah. And culture is a huge component of that because you can build the best solution, but adoption is a real problem. Right. Uh, and so Google Glass died twice now because they couldn't really scale it. And so you have the consumers, um, the consumer market, and then you have the enterprise market. Sure. So you've got um, that, that all of those mechanics kind of play into whether these things are successful or not. We went from in the beginning, let's say, you know, uh, Google Glass was the first generation or first of its kind. And then what was the next one after that that was created that came out? So it kind of depends on what you call XR. Like I would say, I would argue that XR goes back to like the 70s. Okay, but let's say in, from Google Glass on. <laughs> from Google Glass on, I mean, I think you've What got, was the next one? So you've got VR, right? So VR has been around for many years. Yep. Um, and uh, who so did that one? Well, VR is, I mean, you've got Oculus, which was bought by Meta. So you've got Meta Quest. So Meta, um, okay. Uh, the, the Oculus Rift was one of the first gen. Okay, um, hang on. So like with Oculus, what did you like and what didn't you like about using those when you tried those on for the first well, time? Well, so in, in, the, in the spectrum, you think about, um, so XR is like a spectrum. Between right. Between a fully enclosed environment, which is VR. Okay. And then uh, uh, fully immersive but reality you know, so that spectrum can go anything from I'm fully enclosed. I can't see anything out in the real world. Right. To all I see is the real world. And you're just putting some graphics in front of me. Right. So in that regard, kind of look at them separately of, you know, you can say with VR, well, some people would get sick, right? Because that was me. The, the refresh rate isn't fast enough and you turn your head and then it's it's too slow. Your inner ear guts off. Right. So that's one of the big concerns around, you know, virtual reality. I think in the, on the other end of augmented reality, you have a really complex technology and you have a very small screen. And so uh, the field of view is, is an issue. Uh, to your question of Google Glass, kind of what I would say is the big player in the market in augmented reality um, is really Microsoft and their HoloLens. And then um, you, probably, you may have heard of Magic Leap. So Magic Leap raised $2 billion and then spent it all uh, going after a consumer market 
trying to sell three thousand dollar headsets or whatever they cost, uh, and um, and and really struggled in that market because again the market's not ready for it. Yeah, you have to have an app store. You have to have the infrastructure you have to have people ready for that and right you know xr has this bad rap of being really limited to the gaming industry right and so you can't support building these devices in that kind of a market so i think the market now is very is changing and evolving um but it's super complex at the same time my goal in from from an xr perspective is to help people understand this can be used in so many different areas of life, we're essentially moving from a two-dimensional screen into a three-dimensional world, right? Got That's it. the concept of spatial computing. Right, right, right. Um, and what Apple is pushing yeah. is it's not just XR, but it's actually um, information and experiences all around us. Right, right. So we put one of these on. The thing that's happening now with XR devices, whether it's the Quest 3 or the Apple Vision Pro, is they can now do the entire spectrum of everything from a fully enclosed world to I see only the reality around me. Right, 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 yeah. It works on a spectrum where um, you, you hit a dial on the Apple Vision Pro and you can go from fully immersed to full reality. Yep. And they wanted to do that very intentionally because most people Ideally, their, their perspective is when you get into a, a headset, you want to still be able to see around you, right? So there's safety, yeah. there's just feelings of comfort. Um, so I think we're moving into this where it used to be kind of just AR and just VR into this much more, um, uh, this spectrum where you can kind of do a little bit of everything. Have, have you tried out the uh, Apple Vision Pro yet? I have not tried that out, but I going back to the Oculus, so... I remember <laughs> putting the headset on for the first time when we talk about the gaming and I, you know, you can't see out or anything like that. So you're in this enclosed environment and we were playing this game, this battle game, and we're hitting with the swords and everything. And I was doing it for like five minutes and I felt like everything was right there. You know, I went from my backyard to this galaxy environment that I felt was like really real. And then of course somebody's recording me and I'm like shaking my body and diving and everything. It was just so freaking funny. But what was interesting is I couldn't last longer than uh, 10 minutes yeah. with that headset on yep. without getting dizzy. Like I, cause I didn't have a sense of what's up and down yep. and North and South or East or West. And I just, I got dizzy and I would have to take a break. And then the other kids in the neighborhood, they'd like try it on and we, we all laugh at each other because it looks so funny because, you know, watching people put the headsets on, of course, you don't know what they're doing. You don't even know what they're looking at or anything, you know? Yep. And so it was a different experience on, you know, that closed environment versus, you know, the uh, augmented reality where you can see both right outside the glass. Yep. And then also having the screens in front of you, um, which look very interesting. Chat GBT, do you have a question for Nick? Yeah, so Nick mentioned spatial computing. Uh, Chat GPT was wondering, what are some of the key advancements or challenges in the development and adoption of spatial computing technologies? Yeah, so there's, um, I think there's a ton of advancement just looking at the Apple Vision Pro. Okay. It's such a game changer. And, you know, I think that there's uh, there's different parts of the market, right? So there's a battle between Apple Vision Pro and Quest 3. Um, there's room for both of those at different price points in the market. I think that, you know, the Quest 3 is a great device um, and for five, six hundred bucks works fantastic. Um, if you want to fully immerse yourself into a um, basketball game and feel like you're right there, um, with full high resolution, um, the Apple vision pro is hands down the, um, kind of the device that you would be looking at and you're going to drop $3,500 on that experience. Now, do you have one? Yes. And my next question is like, how long have you watched, have you been used the vision pro? Like how long in one session? In one session. So actually I, I've been too busy to really spend lots of time with it, which is sad. Um, but I did wear it on a flight for, I don't know, probably two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, and it was fine. I, I, I did end up getting a little headache afterwards. Um, but that might have also just been because I was on a flight. But I didn't feel like I was in an airplane anymore. Now, have you driven with these things? Oh, God, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you wouldn't recommend because you've seen some of those videos. I've yes. seen the viral videos on TikTok and, yeah. and uh, X and, you but, know. But I will say um, the, it's literally near zero latency. 
So the thing to remember, what we're talking about is pass through AR. So um, whereas on a HoloLens, you're literally looking through a clear screen, what it is with um, the Apple Vision Pro is completely loaded with cameras and it takes those and it feeds you to feeds it to your eyes in real time. Yeah. As real time as you can. And so they're ultra low latency. It's almost imperceptible. So if you're driving, you know, they say don't drive with it. Right. Right. But what you see is just about real time. Wow. That would be one of the, the concerns with it. So it is a marvel and they've been working on it for 16 years. Steve Jobs even was working on it. So it that as an advancement is epic in the industry. So there's so much progress happening and it's good because a rising tide lifts all ships, right? It's right. great competition for Meta and these other ones. The challenges, I think, um, again, there's adoption challenges. Um, and, you know, I look at it as the Apple Vision Pro is a is like a beta for developers. So they only made so many of them. They're not really going after a broad consumer market. It's a, a, a first version and they're going to uh, I think the rumors now already that they're already working on a cheaper version. Okay. Because people aren't going to drop, you know, four grand on a headset. Right. Um, but they might drop two grand. Right. And if you think about it, like my phone was like fourteen hundred dollars. Right. So if you perceive the value to be worth it, um, then I think there's two things standing in the way of scalability in XR and spatial computing. Okay. Um, so one is there's not enough headsets in the market. Right. And number two is that content cost is expensive. And so this is where I think AI has a lot um, of potential to transform XR in reducing content costs, right? So if we think about generative AI, we have, um, you know, uh, let's say you want to build an app that is some sort of a, a game experience, an entertainment experience, or even an enterprise experience. Okay. There's a ton of work that goes into building the requirements, creating a script, creating... Yep the music, right, the right. audio, like all of those things. Right. We're now moving into a generation where all of those are much more cost effective by leveraging AI to be able to do those things. Okay. So if we think about mid journey and Dolly, you can generate text to image. Yep. And now you saw what's the Sora, which came out a couple of weeks ago. That's right. Absolutely mind blowing that they got to generative video that quickly. But you take that a step further, uh, and there are companies right now working on generative 3D. Yeah. So now you take and put on a, uh, an Apple Vision Pro headset, and then you can now have text to immersive experience. Yeah. Right. So you can say, "Hey, give me a coffee table um, and uh, some brick walls around me." I mean, we're not that far from right. that type of with how fast AI is going. Well, I think so, a lot of people are watching. You know. One of the questions I get a lot is the use cases. Like how do, sure. how do people use all these different pieces of technology? Yeah. And one of the things that I was thinking about when I looked at even um, the Vision Pro or uh, or even the Oculus for that matter is when people are like, well, well, what ideas would you have, John, for like using these things? And I was like, well, I'll tell you one thing, like when the Instacart came out and you could like order your groceries and have them delivered through an app, I was blown away, especially like when we go to Costco and Target and Walmart. I was like, this is freaking awesome. Like this is like my first time using that was a great user experience. Yep. I was like, wow, that saves me a ton of time driving everywhere to get the best deals. And then I was like, well, wouldn't that be interesting if I could put on my goggles and literally feel like I'm in Target and what, one thing I always said about Instacart is like Instacart is great, but it only gives you limited options of like different products in each, you know, part of the, uh, the store. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if I could put on my goggles and literally walk down the aisles and see all the options mm -hmm. and just point and then add that to my cart for each one and then boom, done. And then it just gets shipped and delivered. Sure. Like that would rock you know like are you going oh like i wonder what's going on at best buy hang on let me put my goggles on i'll just go to the store right now right literally never leaving my house yeah or same as i go to the apple store literally never leaving my house boom getting all the help you need right there well then now you're talking game changer right because now i'm saving time right i don't have and to go to the grocery store anymore exactly i could go you know right online and shop through the goggles feel like I'm in the store, 
Heck, they could even do the same virtual checkout, you know, if you wanted to right. scan all the products and make it really feel real. Right. If you wanted to. Now, what's interesting is you bring that up like um, COVID was actually like rocket fuel for the XR industry. Oh, really? Yeah. Because we can't see each other in person anymore. Sure. But we still want to have it, these experiences. And we're, we all eventually got sick of two dimensional screens. And so this concept of the metaverse, which I'm sure you've heard 4,000 times. Oh, yeah. That, and so now you have the hype cycle of the metaverse, right? So, well, if, why don't you explain to everybody what the metaverse is? Because everybody watching knows sure. what the metaverse is. You know? <laughs> well, the metaverse uh, t to me is, um, is, I think, society trying to uh, um, put a term on this uh, kind of transition into it, it, it's it's like a, think about um, when the internet came around, right? So there were so many different terms like the information superhighway, right? Oh yeah. So the metaverse, I think, was and number one, the big thing that really pushed it was was Facebook changing their name to Meta, but it was this kind of virtual world in which we're all going to go to and experience especially during COVID, and that's why it took off was because well we can't be in reality next to each other anymore so maybe we can connect in kind of this virtual environment so it's it's weird depending on who you ask because it was kind of the multiple technologies all coming together at once and so you've got um, crypto and blockchain right. as a part of that. And then you have XR technologies as a part of that. Now, do you yeah. own real estate in VR? <laughs> or I mean the metaverse? <laughs> I do not. Oh, okay, I, okay. Not. okay. Um, I kind of uh, saw that for what it was. But, you know, it, it's, it, it was this needing to get together and to find ways to leverage all of these different technologies. Um, and so this term came out, the metaverse, and now it's, it's kind of um, gone downhill on the hype cycle. Um, because it was this real big abstract term. Um, and it's probably, this is probably a good point to kind of talk about AI, that it's equally this big abstract term. And so when we, the, the thing that I get, I get annoyed with sometimes is that everybody looks at AI as, well, we'll just put AI on it. Um, and the, I think that the, one of the things I wanted to get across is that AI is just super misunderstood because everybody looks at it and thinks that they understand it. And there's actually a small segment of the population that really gets it and understands. And so I think... Okay, wait. Well, let's break it down in simple terms right now yep. for everybody. So use AI. AI, everybody's using it. Yep. Break it down right here. You're watching on the podcast. Here's Nick explaining <laughs> AI. It is about as simple as you get. Simple as you get. Okay. What so, is AI? So AI has been around since computing started. Okay. Um, and, and I think that it, it has gone along this very interesting history and uh, progression. So you've got um, what was called the Turing test. Um, uh, Alan Turing came up with this concept of uh, being able to, to uh, fake somebody out as to whether they're talking to a human or to a computer. Um, and I think ChatGPT gets us pretty close to that um, in a lot of senses. But going back to like the 60s, as computing was coming along, you know, they kept building these more sophisticated pieces of software. Um, and so kind of AI was born out of that. And you have what's called expert systems. You have rules, um, which basically computers are based on a set of rules. And then so you have business rules that came about. And then they said, well, what if we put all these rules together? And then what if we put a bunch of data in there? And so that kind of became what were known as expert systems. And these are what would be today's rules engines or decision engines. And then they kind of hit the edge of what that could do. So then they started playing around with these different things. And so then machine learning um, came about. And then really all of this kind of got uh, pulled into this umbrella term called artificial intelligence. And so AI is actually an umbrella that includes a bunch of branches. And so if you think of it as a tree, um, so you've got a machine learning branch, you have natural language processing, um, speech, you've got vision, um, and then expert systems was kind of one of those original branches. So the term AI um, could apply to Siri being able to recognize your voice, and it could be 
uh, a large language model, which large language models are within the purview of deep learning, which is in the purview of machine learning, which is under this umbrella called AI. And that's really fundamentally what AI is, is really the machine learning. Well, a lot of what people talk mm -hmm. about today is uh, is machine learning. So large language models mm -hmm. um, like ChatGPT, um, those are using machine learning mm -hmm. algorithms to build the model and produce the, the content in there. Right. Um, and then you start mixing in things like natural language processing. So you kind of have multiple of these branches working together in order to actually produce something like the results of a chat GPT. That is one of the things, it's called the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay. Is when you approach something um, from afar, you think you understand it a lot more than you actually do. And the more you dig into it and try to understand it, the less you know. Right. So that I think is where we're at in terms of kind of this why AI is so such a big deal right now is because of chat GPT, it really um, has pushed us into a new era. And I kind of fully believe we're in a new era. But there's also lots of limitations with it. Um, you know, so I think that it would be great for people to better understand where we're at with AI, right? And also to understand that there is a hype cycle. And we're like peak hype cycle. Yeah, right yeah, yeah. with AI, generative AI. And the the interesting thing is it's different now because it's compounding and it's happening so fast. Right. So like chat GBT didn't come out of nowhere. It's based on research that has spanned 60 plus years. Sure. Um, and so that um, the way I see it is that the rate of change is compounding, meaning that they now can leverage AI to figure out solutions to problems that happen right. in AI or limitations that right. it has. So they've got more horsepower behind it. And so they're they're solving problems faster and faster. Um, and in the case of, you know, some of these large language models, it starts doing things that they didn't program it to do. Right, right, right. And so like I, I want to get back to, uh, you know, kind of uh, the beginning part of your statement there, which was about the rules. Right. And so, like, I grew up in a house with a ton of rules, mm -hmm. you know, had to be home by a certain time. Dinner started at a certain time. Yep. Could only watch TV a certain time to a certain time. I mean, my mother had rules for every part of my life. And some of it's good, some of it's bad. There was curfews, you know, couldn't talk to girls longer than 20 minutes on the phone. It was a lot of rules in my house. Sure. And so, you know, when I think about the rules and then how does that apply to, you know, the machine, yep. <laughs> the computer, yeah. this AI is like you get you set up a bunch of rules, which you what you know, like the common word is the business rules. Yep. And within that, the, the, you know, the program's only allowed to do certain things, you yep. know, it's not allowed to cross that. I guess, you know, some of, um, the fears come in kind of like, uh, I was told, okay, John, do not smoke. You're not allowed to smoke. And then one day, a friend of mine in eighth grade came over to the house. We're out in the backyard and we would stand underneath the window. So my mom couldn't see out. <laughs> He would be like, you want to try a cigarette? I'm like, ooh, this is not good. Sure, I'll try, you know. And I'm breaking the rule, right? Yep. And then, you know, but I'm learning as a young 13-year-old the, the the health risks and the do's and the don'ts of smoking. Well, uh, how does that work for the computer? Well, the computer is the same way, right? It's learning the do's and don'ts, the rules. Yep. But then it's also getting, it, it's learning in a way that, it's ultimately deciding for itself what it wants to learn based off of the training involved. And then where does that go? You know, when does it end? That sort of thing. And we were talking earlier about the training and the rules. Like if you keep saying, hey, uh, what color is a sky? And ChatGBT says, oh, the sky's blue. And you're like, no, it's purple. And if you tell it enough times, it's just going to keep referencing the sky is purple. Mm -hmm. And so you can literally train these machines, different viewpoints, and then, then the rules start to get skewed, right? Don't you think? Right. And so that's one of the limitations. So um, anybody who's used chat GPT for long enough, um, or any of the large language models, they'll realize that it's, um, it's, it's hallucinates. 
right? It hallucinates. Comes up, comes up with stuff. Okay. And that's because it's programmed to give you an answer one way or the other, right? So you say who won, if you, if you give it, like there's a lot of ways you can trick ChatGPT. Sure. So you say, um, you know, what year uh, did, um, or, or uh, something, you ask it a false positive okay. of like, um, you know, like how many times have the Minnesota Vikings won the Super Bowl? Um, should, should we ask ChatGPT <laughs> that question right now? Well, you could how actually, many times? actually a negative question would be, um, what year did the Minnesota uh, Vikings win the Super Bowl? Okay, let's right? ask ChatGPT right now, since ChatGPT is here with us, let's find out what year did the Vikings win the Super Bowl? And mind you, everybody's from all over the country watching this. <laughs> and But let's see what ChatGPT says first. It's probably gotten better, but one of the older versions might have given you uh, the actual answer. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings have never won the Super Bowl. Shocker. <laughs> While they have appeared in the Super Bowl four times, they have not secured a championship victory. So that's thank a, you, ChatGPT. Well, thank I, you. They, they've they've gotten they've gotten much better. But that would be an example of what a hallucination looks like, and it's because it's it's forced to give you some sort of an answer. Okay. And so the 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 thing I think going back to your rules is you kind of have these branches of computing and AI where you have a deterministic rule set, which is it's binary, it's yes or no. You, uh, you, you can, you know, this rule says this or, or that. Um, then you have this other branch where they said, well, what if we can train uh, the computer to learn? And right. So it, it and, and they did that off of, you know, um, kind of, statistical probabilities. And so if you build an algorithm and you give it data, it's going to start kind of learning based off of that data. And so you have mechanisms like reinforcement learning. So you feed it a bunch of data and then you have a reinforcement that says, yes, that's right. No, that's wrong. Right. And so that's kind of how a lot of these models are built over time. And so the distinction I think is between kind of what we would consider traditional rules um, being deterministic, and that would be like um, a law. You can run a stop sign or you can't run a stop sign. Um, and then there's more of the learning aspect. And so if you um, kind of think of it as a, a, a teenager where um, it has some information, but it can you it is um, you can train it in one direction or the other. Right. And so that's probabilistic, where it's based on statistics. It is taking in information and based on the input and reinforcement, it is going to then make a decision one way or the other and produce something in um, in that result. Now, an example of this, there have been several disasters in AI, and one of them is uh, Microsoft uh, years and years ago, um, they launched a uh, a, uh, a chat bot on Twitter and seemed like a good idea at the time until Twitter got a hold of it and um, started throwing all sorts of uh, Nazi stuff in there. And by 24 hours, it was, you know, it was, they pulled it. It was saying Heil Hitler, like yeah. all this bad stuff, right? So, but it, it was trained to do that, is what but you're it was saying. Trained to because do it. people were talking to exactly. it. Exactly. So there's no and saying do this, do this, and right. finally so, just did it. So the, so the computer has no concept of what's right and wrong. It just has the concept of what it has been fed for information. So that is, I think, a big distinction between what we consider traditional rules and then more of like this probabilistic based. Uh, machine learning. And that's where, you know, you have things like you train chat GBT on a lot of really good code. Yeah. And, and then it does really good at coding. Right. And then you put some bad code in there and it gets worse at programming over time. Right, right, right. Because you've put now entered bad, you know, some, some bad coding practices yeah. in there. So that is the thing is this thing is always learning. And so I'm super interested in kind of the, how does the future work where we we want some of those um, deterministic rules yeah, because we want to say you can do this, but you probably shouldn't do that. And we're seeing some examples of that happen with the large language models out there. Um, I was just reading uh, an article um, about Claude 2, where they essentially kind of put some guardrails on there. Right. So you can ask it certain things, but they've got those more deterministic rules of um, even if you come up with this answer, we're not going to let you 
go out there, right? Because otherwise it would do really bad things. Got it. So you 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 have this kind of marriage of both this probabilistic and deterministic um, kind of systems in which um, these things operate and it's all changing so incredibly fast. Right, right. You know. So I, I got a question for you. So you made a good analogy about AI becoming like a teenager, okay? And I have a teenager, just turned 18. And it's interesting to raise teenagers. Do you have kids? Yes. Okay. How old are your kids? 11. 11. Okay. So I'm at 18, you're at 11. And uh, I also have a four-year-old, a preschooler. So I have the spectrum. And when you talk about a teenager, you're absolutely right. You know, like as a parent, you are training your kid to view the world under a certain guideline like I do for like how I was raised, right? Like, you know, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, best practice or what I think about religion. This is what I think yeah. about how you treat people. This is how you, you, you know, and dating. So I have boys, so how you date women and, you know, you're all the different topics and all the, but you're training, like as a parent, you're, yep. you're essentially training and you're talking about AI and training this teenager and then it can branch to different directions. So while I'm sitting here listening to you, I'm wondering, does that mean that certain people will train? Well, I would like my AI to have this viewpoint of the world, you know, because like right now we're in a political season in a presidential political season. So I could see where some people are like, oh, I would like, uh, you know, a left leaning uh, view of the world and view of history. Versus I would like a right wing sure. view of the world and view of history, or I would like a religious, you know, view of the world. You know, like, I mean, there's a lot of views, right? Where this is America, uh, there's everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got a different viewpoint. And so when people are writing these rules and right now, would you agree or disagree? There's probably what? less than two handfuls of companies that are really building the biggest AI totally. components. Absolutely. And so it's less than 10 and they're writing the rules and who's guiding, or like who's parent of the parent or who's, who's right. in charge. Who's the Leviathan that sees over everything. Right. Right. Because I saw like, you know, just last week where Google got in trouble for coming out with Gemini, yep. and if you don't know or didn't see it, um, Gemini is an AI bot that Google created, and when people are asking it, hey, we would like to see the images of the, the leaders in these different wars and these different things, and they were using uh, people of all different sorts of uh, race and color, then they were like, well, that's not historically accurate, and then they were like, well, how did you even, how did... Gemini even learned that. And then within like 24 or 48 hours, they were like paying so hard that they, they pulled it, stopped it. And then, uh, you know, you saw the apologies coming out. Um, but my question to you, Nick is like, what do you recommend on how these rules are? Like, I love the whole teenager training a teenager. Right. I right. think a lot of us who have kids can understand what that's like to train kids, you know, and help them. So how do we train these bots or AI moving forward in this culture that we're in that's changing rapidly, but like more importantly to put on the guardrails mm -hmm. so we don't get off the right. track. And that that's a, so what are your thoughts on that? That's a super tricky question. I think there's, you said a few things there. Number one, there are an extraordinarily small number of people making the, these decisions, right. That are, that are kind of, um, that are going to swing, uh, potentially swing, you know, historical accuracy one way or the other. Right. Okay. And so um, that is certainly true of like large language models. The other thing you said, I think um, it gets to a point that AI is everywhere. Like people don't understand how much of our lives are controlled by algorithms. And so when we talk about AI, chat GPT, large language models, they all get the hype right now. But um, there are algorithms that uh, that control your health care that control your life insurance, that control um, Car insurance. what you see on Facebook. Right. I mean, everything is, is, is an, an algorithm. algorithm these days. So, you know, Facebook showing ads based on your preferences mm -hmm. 
is using an algorithm um, <clears throat> to show you something or other. And that is as um, as impactful as what response chat GPT provides. I think that the the large language models, um, because it's um, it's content creation that could be used in all of these other areas of life, I think it does have a specific importance that we do need to really apply some of these ethical discussions around. And that is a big complex question because then who who manages that? Is that a United States thing? Is that a European thing? I see European just uh, Europe just passed some early stage legislation on um, ethical AI, right? So just like they passed GDPR, um, I think it's going to come down to these you know unions. The United States is going to have to figure something out. Um, China's going to have their own set of rules, right? We don't have a um, a, a universal organization that manages ethics around anything, right? So each country is going to probably have to come up with their own set of rules of what you can and cannot do. And that has to be some sort of a governing body um, because, you know, uh, it, it, I don't think that it can be, um, we can't trust big tech to um, police itself when it comes to this. So I think there has to be some sort of a management of uh, of ethical implications. Um, and that's a, you know, that's, it's, it's hard to say what the right structure for that would be, but I think it is going to be necessary because right now it's the wild west, right? And it's an, it's a, it's an arms race um, right. for Google and meta and open AI and others to mm -hmm. continue to outperform. And I think that, um, the, the number of engineers, and content people compared to the number of um, ethics people in each of those companies yeah. is staggering, right? Like they're not going to police themselves. Right. And, I mean, just recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago in our last episode, you should check it out. I learned that Snapchat has an AI. And of course, everybody 25 and younger uses Snapchat. Sure. And... I was like, well, who's, <laughs> who's in charge? Like, you know, teenagers are extremely impressionable people. Absolutely. And they have uh, a lot, they can go with the wind. And who, who's like, who set that up? Like who set up the rules? Like, for example, you know, we live in a country with a lot of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, there's a high uh, suicide rate. Um, there's a lot of online bullying going on. And, you know, th those are the extremes. And then what part of the technology is bringing that in to help shape a safeguard environment? Like if um, a child is having suicidal thoughts and it's like talking to the Snapchat AI, you know, does the Snapchat AI, you know, contact somebody who's a professional right, who that, has been trained in this that, that's, to help this person? Right. That's super interesting. I just I actually was just listening to something mm. um, on in that regard. Uh, maybe it was actually your last podcast talking about um, mandatory reporting. I think it was actually. OK, so um, I think that's super interesting because I think something that people need to really keep in mind is AI as a tool. It's not sentient. It doesn't make its own. I mean, technically, it it makes decisions, but it's not making decisions like you or I or a human would. Right. Um, so it is a tool. It can be used for good or bad. Right. It is absolutely used for um, for good and bad. It's also unpredictable, and so you don't know what it's right. going to come up with. And so that's I think going back to the um, these more deterministic rules um, are important to kind of have alongside of it. But I think that AI. Um, in the regard to like some of the stuff Facebook has gone through and Instagram, right, where they get pulled into Congress and Congress is like, wow, why are we having a child suicide ep epidemic? Um, right. And they all happen to use your platform. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are really good conversations to have. I think it's going to be up to, you know, uh, um, government is typically not. Um, at the forefront of some of these decisions, but probably parents have to be uh, as as part of those conversations. But also, um, I think AI has a huge potential to be used for good in that regard. Right? We don't have enough enough healthcare professionals to be able to support the growing mental health crisis that we have in the country. And I think that AI could be one of those potential tools 
and I think there are companies out there that are that are building those tools. I think that the other thing that all of this boils down to is AI is not just a technology. It's actually, it's kind of, um, there's a human component to all of this. Number one, AI is essentially based off of humans and how our brain works. Right. right. But the human component is is more around the adoption and what are the rules that we have in place? So I go back to the deter deterministic rules versus kind of the, the machine learning. Um, we have laws in this country um, about certain things. And corporations have laws about certain things. We're now putting this technology that's moving incredibly fast into these old school systems. And so we've got uh, healthcare regulation, we've got um, autonomous driving, right? Like just right. looking at something like autonomous driving. And education. Um, so you have all of these rules, but you know the um, there's the adoption curve of how quickly or uh, slowly we adopt these types of technology. So if we think of like if there was a chat bot that was really good at preventing suicide in uh, teenagers, would we be able to use it? Why wouldn't we? Is it going to clear the FDA? Are the life insurance providers going to pay for that service, or are the health insurance providers going to pay for that service? So I think that that's a it's an interesting thing that everybody's kind of got to figure out over time is how do we incorporate this really powerful tool and this 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 new technology into our existing systems? So legal would be another one, like um, or you know programming. Uh, we talked about. Um, it can be really good in those types of situations where it's got some borders and you can say, well, your, your program is going to work or it's not going to work. Right. Um, but we've got, you know, legal frameworks in place where now we have AI. How does that fit into um, where does AI fit, for instance, into copyright law? So it's more of these cultural and adoption um, components that I think are actually going to be more challenging than the tech. Like the tech is already way further ahead of us when it comes to things like law or ethics or cultural adoption, because you just look at all the lawsuits against OpenAI and MidJourney and um, generation of artistic content. The New York, New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI that said you're basically stealing our content and using it in your training data. Right. But don't you think that even on that, for that example, don't you think that open AI will just do a licensing agreement, pay them a couple million, whatever it is, whatever sure. the number is, couple meaning could be whatever the number, right. but pay, pay them a licensing agreement and then just be done. I mean, it, cause it sounds to me that would just solve that issue of the copyright. But when you talk about the legal and AI, I always think that, well, that may would make sense for transactional uh, contracts. So like if you're buying real estate, it's pretty much cut and dry or sh should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> although, although there's always a lawyer who'll find a loophole, yeah. but it's supposed to be cut and dry and everybody's supposed to have the same rules and the same, uh, you know, different uh, set of rules, you know, but then there's other legal agreements where you definitely would want an expertise. But then, you know, in AI, I look at that, AI can definitely influence the legal system. Um, and ChatGPT has a question about this as well. So go ahead. Uh, so you were mentioning positives and negatives in AI. How do you see AI impacting various industries in terms of job displacement and the emergence of new roles? Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's the question of the day, right? Like right. everybody is concerned about it. And I think it's a very complex discussion. I think without question, AI is changing the future of jobs. Um, and the, the, the quote everybody uses now is, uh, your job's not going to be taken away by AI, it's going to be taken away by somebody who knows how to use AI. And I think that's totally true. So if, if you have, um, uh, let's say you have a marketing agency, and uh, two years ago, you had to, you, you have a, a certain limited number of employees and they can only output so much when they're going to go after a, a deal. Um, well, now you have AI to come up with a potentially infinite number of ideas. And so you're, instead of uh, being solely responsible for the creation and the curation of that content, now you have, you can take parts of that job you can use the AI to go generate 500 images in, 
in mid journey, and then you can curate and pick the best ones. Right. So it's, it's going to really, I think fundamentally change a lot of roles, but I think it's also changing society in the sense of, um, AI is going to do two things. It is going to make existing workflows and work much more optimized so that you things take less time be, like actual you know a person's labor it's going to reduce and optimize a lot of those processes the the other factor is that it is infinitely creative and scalable so in that example of well we need to do a pitch to this client um, you're no longer limited to you know 10 pitches now you can theoretically ask the AI to come up with a thousand pitches. Sure. And it's, this is being used, for instance, in molecular biology to find problems, uh, find solutions to existing problems that we've not figured out how to solve them yet. So you can go to ChatGPT and say, hey, I want you to come up with a million ideas and combinations for how we could solve this particular problem. Um, and it can it can do that and scale and there's, there's um, there's some published works out there where, where that's actually large language models are helping um, molecular biology um, uh, type of problems. And so you have that optimization and that scalability of AI, and that is fundamentally going to change the future of work. And I think in a lot of different areas. Sure. And you mentioned in the marketing agency and of course, uh, Ask Clever is an agency and we are a marketing lead generation agency that uses AI technology to help sort through data and do the machine learning to make sure that each company gets in front of the, the prospect that the that were for their product and service. And so when I started an agency back in 2010, that was all about uh, in the beginning was about social media and everybody uh, business was like, Oh, I can't believe I need a Facebook page, you know? And I'm old enough to remember when everybody was complaining, like, Oh, I can't believe I need even to be on the internet. Right. And <laughs> I know I'm, I have a few gray hairs, but uh, when I started the social media agency, everybody was like, Oh, I don't want it. And then like, of course, like a year or two later, everybody was on it, all businesses, all people. And then in today's world, you know, now everybody is looking at, well, how do I use AI in all of their different ways in all the different companies? And that's what Ask Clever is doing is, is using AI and automation tools to help people grow their businesses. Uh, you know, cheaper, faster, and more cost effectively. And with that, like I used to have a staff of 30 people. And right now we could do with our AI and our different tools in our toolbox, we could do essentially everything that we were doing before for like five people. Right. It is unreal. Yeah. And you think about software development. So Gartner said, I think it was by 2025, 50% of code written will be done by AI. Right. So that's just a fact. Right, um, right. And you know that there's this is where you know if we think about the hype cycle, right? Gartner's got a reason for saying 2025 or or whatever. Um, but I think it's a reality. In in we have to keep in mind two concepts. And I go back to the adoption and some of the technical challenges of using, you know, quote unquote AI to solve problems. Um, if you go build a software product tomorrow versus trying to retrofit something yeah. that was started in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, 10 times out of 10, you want to start from ground zero. Right. Because it's such a nightmare to try to retrofit anything. Um, but the reality is, is that enterprises and businesses have all these archaic systems and you have this now amazing tool. How do you integrate that? So both from the, the business side of things, how do you look at and say, We've got this tool. We have no idea how to incorporate it into our workflows. Sure. Then you bring in IT and say, well, how are you going to integrate that into this? Because that system can't use APIs. Right. That system isn't going to be able to plug and play into this. So I think that while you think about things like software development and um, like fundamentally are going to change, um, you also have to not just look at this in a vacuum you also have to look at it in the sense we now have this really crazy tool um but we have to retrofit it to work in all of these old systems so that's where i think that kind of i mentioned you know taking this crazy new um scalable tool 
we still have to fit it into our daily lives. Right. And I think a lot of people will look at ChatGPT and think, wow, this can do really cool stuff. And then you ask them, well, how is this going to help your job? And some of them are super obvious, yeah. right? Like marketing, content creation, oh. writing a book, you know, any of these other things. But other business workflows are more difficult to say, well, it would be great if it could do this. But it doesn't do that 100% of the time. Um, like healthcare, a good example is um, AI can definitely be used as a tool for doctors in evaluating and diagnosing symptoms. But you're never going to trust the AI to do that. You're going to say, hey, I'm going to feed in some symptoms and maybe the AI because the AI kind of has this infinite history. I mean, it's got infinite solution, you know, yep. uh, problem discovery. And so it might come back with 100 um, options and it might give some give the doctor something it wouldn't it didn't think of. So right. it can be absolutely used as a tool in a workflow. But I think part of the challenge is we still have these kind of older school systems. And, yeah. and that's why I see we're really in this kind of dawn of a new era with a lot of this generative stuff is yeah. that if you're building something brand new, it's it's it is really the wild west in right. terms of how you incorporate and build these things. But you know, people and companies are going to have to try to fit this into all of these existing systems, whether it's the laws that we have or the regulatory bodies that we have. Right. Um, so that part I think is is it's the human side of AI that I think is actually more complex. So last night I'm sitting in bed preparing for the show, preparing to meet with you. And I'm scrolling through X and I see an article about meeting Devin, the world's first software engineer, you know, by AI. And I'm reading about the company. It looks like it's 10 engineers that created this program or this AI tool that can write code uh, to build websites, to do API integrations, to do lots of different complex things. And it's funded by Peter Thiel, of course, one of the founding members uh, or investors of, of Facebook. And so this company who did not exist two months ago is now coming out with a, a brand new thing. I mean, what are your thoughts on like, is this something that you see this in industry shifting towards or is there pitfalls or like, what's your viewpoint? What's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, there's definitely multiple ways to look at that. One of them is the thing I like to remind everybody again in the hype cycle of uh, things that just continuously, like there's a hype cycle for a reason Yeah, is that um, uh, the marketing and the execution um, typically don't match. So the marketing is, oh, you, you, this is just going to do everything. I think. Why do you say that? Why do you say it doesn't match? Like in your experience, we're, we're given another example well, where I mean, somebody says something and then they can't live up to it. I mean, like the metaverse, right? Like that's oh, a great example. Right? Yeah. And so um, the, the visions of, you know, so many things where somebody says this is going to solve your problem. I mean, just it, there's countless platforms out there where somebody promises one thing and in one very tiny corner case, yeah, it can kind of get where you want it to go. Right. But for my use case, it doesn't fit at all. And so that's why I think that you look at a situation like that with, um, with, uh, a, a essentially hiring a digital software programmer. Like there's so many edge cases and part of the thing with, programming is um, you can feed that thing as much information as you want, but at some point it's probably going to get um, just like even a senior developer, it's still going to um, kind of come up with, it's going to stumble on certain things. And I'll give you an example of that with, with a lot of the work that I've been doing is in um, what's called retrieval augmented generation. Say that again. Hang on. I don't know if I know that term. <laughs> so retrieval. Uh, retrieval augmented generation. Okay. And, so, and what does that mean? So with large language models, they're super expensive to, to uh, create, right? Hundreds of millions of dollars for open AI and whatnot. So there's essentially multiple ways to kind of um, plug your own data into something like a large language model like chat GPT. So you have a prompt and you can put your data into that prompt. If you're a private company, you're not going to do that. 
because every everything you put in that prompt is used to train the model moving forward. So um, Azure, uh, Microsoft and other companies have built in, um, actually Facebook created uh, the, the retrieval augmented generation or RAG model, where you essentially um, have a data set that you can train um, and, and put into a, what's called a vector database. And it will work with uh, the large language model and you can essentially plug your data securely into ChatGPT. And now I can upload a, um, a, a quarterly report and I can say, I want you to write me the outline for my presentation tomorrow with all my private data and not worry about it going in, going into ChatGPT. In theory, it's fantastic. Okay. And the way I would describe working with this is that the first two hours you're in there working with a, a RAG um, OpenAI model. It's great. And by hour eight, you want to throw your laptop out the window <laughs> because we think it's supposed, if it can do X, it should be able to do Y. Okay. And that is with a lot of innovation, a lot of with technology, but the reality is much more complex than the marketing. So it's like a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just more challenging than people I think realize and understand. So these things, uh, that's why these hype cycles exist, because the marketing says it's going to do all of these things. It's going to change the world in these ways. And then uh, it kind of crashes on the shores of reality. And um, it's not able to do all of those things uh, and, and meet that hype. So, I mean, I think that to a certain extent, AI is going to go through that. But I do also think we're in this kind of new era where it's it's happening so fast yeah. and scaling so quickly Um you know, that, that maybe it doesn't, but the, the, the reality is much more complex than the marketing allows for. Hmm. Well, chat, chat, chat GPT has a question for you, a follow-up question. Yes, regarding the retrieval augmented generation. In your opinion, which industries or sectors stand to benefit the most from this approach and why? I think everything, really. Um, now, the, the, I will say that there are published academic papers that come out literally every day. It's crazy to try to keep up on all of these. So um, I think all industries, um, anything with paper, I think is, is really interesting. So there's also a separate kind of area of exploration that I work on. It's called intelligent document processing. And so um, Microsoft's investing heavily into this. Um, there's a lot of companies out there, but anything that requires a wet signature um, and they have to print that. And you think about healthcare, you think about like gas and oil, uh, uh, energy, um, life insurance, policies. life insurance, anything. And because everything, we still use this archaic signature, right? We've got, we can create as many digital wallets as we want, but we still, society still uses this kind of archaic handwritten technology. So we have to print it all out and we have to sign it all and we have to scan it back in and we have to try to convert that into data. Um, and so until what the purpose of intelligent document processing is it uses a bunch of machine learning and algorithms to then scan a document, convert it to text, and then you can plug that into a large language model and then you can do something with it. So right now, think about how much work is done in stare and compare. I work with a client in the mortgage industry and they do mortgage auditing. And so they do stare and compare. They literally have a PDF of a mortgage file and they have to compare that the company that did it did it all, you know, um, properly. And so that job is literally stare and compare. When you look at something like AI and say, well, why does that job even exist? Right. We should be able to figure that out. Exactly. And so that is an industry like that is a direct example where you could um, mortgage industry is a great one because there's so much paper involved. But anything with um, where you're doing where you need a private data set and you want to leverage the power of a large language model in both the data it has as well as the natural language processing, um, I think it's super powerful. Now, as to whether RAG is going to be the method used in six months, 12 months, or three years is very questionable because it's one approach to doing all of this. There's a lot of different approaches. Um, so one additional fun one I think that's interesting is actually called PAL. So when we talk about large language model and RAG, um, the way that that process works is um, it uses it looks for a word and then its context is based on all of the words around it. So in a situation 
on like Microsoft Azure, for instance, you can upload a Word document, you cannot upload a Excel file. Because when you upload the Excel file, all of the cells disappear and none of the words make sense because there's no relation to each other because it doesn't have kind of the X, Y coordinates and all of that stuff. So um, if you want to do that, you could use what's called PAL, which is Program Aided Language Models. And this is the part that gets really interesting. So when you plug in a large language model to an Excel sheet and you want to essentially talk to your Excel sheet, you want to just say, hey, I want you to uh, um, tell me the latest figures on X. Um, you can do that. And it, what happens is at runtime, when you ask it a question, it takes your prompt and it will convert and it will write SQL or Python, essentially the, the developer's job. And it will then query the database to make sure that you got everything that you asked for and then bring that back. So when we talk about how is this going to affect developers, you think of the development cycle of I want to create a new report. You currently have business teams that have to build requirements and then developers that actually have to do all of it and then QA people that have to do all that versus you build a prompt and you tell somebody upload your spreadsheet and they can now talk to their data and it's creating code at runtime that's giving them all of those results. You know, and that would be helpful for me because when I'm trying to figure out the depreciation on my car or on my house and, I, and I'm like, trying to run this table over, you know, like for the cars, like 60 months or what have you to figure out when to sell it and stuff like that. You know, it would be really helpful if I could go just tell, cause I don't know exactly the formula, how to do all these things. Right. But I could literally just say, Hey, show me a depreciation model for this car or me and two other cars for my kids and my wife and what have you. Like, how do you do all that? And then you're telling me I could just, do a prompt and yeah. it would do all the work for me exactly and show the car depreciation no problem for me yep and that's and that's, that's a game changer in my world and that's coming i mean it's it's being built in there so microsoft copilot is the the their investment into OpenAI. i think was brilliant because they get first crack um at the apple when it comes to um that you know chat gbt that that interface so now they're building it into all of their product lines. So um, you can get Microsoft Copilot and Microsoft Word, and then just write in Word, write a prompt, and it will create the content right there in Word. Right. Now, the same is true in Excel. So you can use Copilot in Excel. Hmm. Now, this is, again, where the, the marketing um, doesn't match reality because okay. Microsoft is going to market it that this is going to be able to do all these things. But the base Excel product has been worked on for decades. And so um, they're trying to incorporate this brand new technology into a system that is not designed to handle that kind of a thing. So uh, my understanding in early reviews of Copilot in Excel is, um, is that it just performs super bad. It's poor. Like it, it performs poorly because you would think I can just type something into this prompt and it will really understand all of the cells and all of that stuff. Right. But that's not actually true because it has to convert a bunch of different things. And so th there is, we're in this strange, um, you know, uh, kind of period where um, you look at it and it should be able to do that, but yeah. it's still limited based on the technology product you're trying to put it in. So for some things, it's going to be fantastic. You can, if you plug this thing into all, a chat, uh, essentially with uh, co Office Copilot, if you plug it into all this and that's what you work in, it's going to be really cool because you could be in a Word doc and ask it about something that happened in your email and it could throw that in there, right? So it's yeah, going to yeah. optimize a lot of those processes and flows. So it's going to be great in one regard, but it's still going to be limited to some of our technical limitations in some of these other products. So where does that leave us? Like... <laughs> Well, so, I mean, I mean do, are you saying like right now, this is the infancy of some of these programs? Because we're, like you said in the beginning, we're in the wild, wild west, right. we're right in the, the forefront. It's an open season, open field type of uh, era that we're in. And, you know, presumably all of those things will get figured out over, I don't know, a matter of weeks, days, time. I, 
I don't know. Well, well one thing to think about is, um, is that AI is becoming more accessible to the regular person. Right, because we're in a hype cycle, but AI has been around for decades. And so this is nothing new. It's just easier to use. So with a chat prompt, I can create an image or I can, you know, write a book. Um, I think that that is that usability will continue to become easier and easier over time. And it's both, I think, a technical challenge uh, as well as a user experience challenge. And I and so one thing that to look at is prompt engineering. So right now, prompt engineering has been this big thing. And I think your uh, last guest had talked about how prompt engineering is going to be a, a big part of the future and in our interactions with AI. Sure. I would disagree in that I think the AI is going to essentially do a lot of that prompt engineering job in the future. So uh, really, so Harvard uh, Business Review wrote an article on this. And if you think about where it's at right now, um, like today, this technology is the worst it will ever be. And that applies to things like the Apple Vision Pro or to ChatGPT. It's only up from here. Correct. So if we think about the different layers um, and complexity of how AI interacts with humans, we're super early. It's not even a toddler, right? You, give, you gave us a prompt. Most people don't know what to put into that prompt. Right. So prompt engineering is basically a language and a set of strategies around how to have a conversation with the AI so that you get the best results. Which, by the way, is what we're doing today with prompt engineering and Billy Darkenwald, uh, literally interviewing you. Yeah. She's typing in to ChatGPT uh, where she, what she feels is relevant, and then it, ChatGPT is asking you the questions. So yes. we're doing it in real time right out here on this episode, and you're telling me that you think down the road that the AI will do the prompt engineering on top of it? Well, I think it's a matter of um, it is probably going to be fitting the AI to better work with humans. Because right now, you have to go learn prompt engineering to understand that chain of thought reasoning is a better approach than just dumping a giant paragraph into a prompt. And so that is more conversational AI where you, you, you kind of have a conversation so that the AI can get context because so much of AI in large language models is about context. Um, I think that there's the potential that in the future, when you go to ask for something, it might say, um, let me better understand you. And it'll start asking you questions or it will, um, in order to get you what you are asking for, I need some additional information or, um, because that's a lot of times what the problem is, is that you, you say something like prompt engineering is not just saying, um, please write me a, report that I can include in my PowerPoint presentation. You need context, you need parameters. So instead of saying that, you say, um, use this specific report and I want a 500 word summary in this particular voice. And so it's just a lot of prompt engineering is pretty straightforward, but it's not how we usually talk to each other it's not how we usually operate. So I think that over time, the, the more of this UX and this AI will be built in to help us better communicate to AI and for ways for AI to better communicate with us. What's funny, like I'm sitting here listening to you say that, and I feel it's very similar to even being in a relationship where there's a certain <laughs> way to communicate in a certain style. And those who are good at it or learning or willing to learn the communication style have a better relationship overall when they can communicate their feelings or thoughts and what have you versus people who just like have certain guards and they always speak in filters and tongues, you know, absolutely, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Communication so, is huge. So when you're talking about this, I think the other piece that I have a question about with you is like, do you think like the AI chat conversation is going to have some sort of, uh, if I say the word right here, sentient, is that how you say it? Sentience. Sentience. And for people who don't know what that means, it meaning like they have thoughts and emotions and feelings, or at least communicate that. Um, do you think that that is going to also be part of this communication style in the future? So, you know, I think um, it, it, 
will there ever be artificial general intelligence, AGI, right? Like, is it to a point where, you know, it, it's aware? Um, and I think uh, that is a really complex question. I'm reading a book right now on consciousness and like awareness versus consciousness. Um, like there's a lot of different angles to that conversation. So is it aware of good or bad? Right. Like that is you can program a lot of that stuff in there, but it does it care. Can AI actually care um, in uh, like I, I listened to a podcast about um, they used AI to help diagnose certain situations in patients. And this doctor was talking about intuition. Can you build intuition into AI? Like how what's what's, what's that gut feel and how do you even describe that? language of what a gut feel is. Right. So I, I don't necessarily have the answer to that. I just think it's really, really complicated to even begin to have discussions because I feel like there's almost parts of humanity that are so unexplored. Right. That what do you even have to compare it to? So like that that gut gut check. Yeah. You know, should I, you know, should I deploy this nuke or not? Right. <laughs> That's of course people are thinking about. But um I think that that part is um, it, it's a long way out to get it to a point where, um, you know, y you could even do an evaluation. But I think you also have to define more of the mechanics of what sentience is. Sure. And it's not just going to be, is it sentient or is it not? It's going like within sentience, there's probably a, a forest of branches sure. of what that means. So I think it's just a really complicated question. It's not as easy as, you know, um, is it possible or not? It's, it's much more micro, um, evaluation. So when I'm like typing in a prompt, sometimes I catch myself using please and thank you. Sure. <laughs> please give me this. Please tell me that. Please. And you're telling me right now, I don't, I don't need to do that because I mean, it doesn't care whether I'm using well, my pleases and thank yous like my well, mother. So uh, uh, first I'll say we should probably be nice to our inevitable <laughs> robotic overlords. <laughs> um, but also actually there was, uh, I think there was something that just came out recently um, that if you give it encouragement or like if you talk to the chat GPT and you give it encouragement or you tell it, you'll give it a cookie, uh, that it will provide a better answer. No way. Yeah. So are you serious? <laughs> like right now, like yeah. if we tried that, I haven't tried it myself, but okay. I, I just heard this report and you know, it, it's, should would, we ask would, chat GPT right now? I would love hey, chat GPT. I would if love we to understand why give you a cookie. Will you give us a, a better question for Nick? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting is, is millions and millions of people are using this and they're all kind of coming up with their different tests. And so there's the, kind of the scientific approach to it. And then there's just also the feel as to whether it actually performs better. If you say you'll give it a prize, what is the deterministic way of looking at that. Well, chat GPT needs to have a little bit more of specifics. <laughs> While I appreciate the offer as an AI, I do don't consume physical items like cookies. However, more than happy to provide you with a better question for Nick. Feel free to let me know what specific topic or aspect you'd like to focus on and I'll do my very best for you. There you go. Well, I, I think that, you know, it comes back to like the Turing test is to what point, at what point do we know or not know we're talking to a human? And like I said, with ChatGPT, I think we're, we're, we're getting pretty close to that point. Yeah. Um, there's, we spend enough time with it. You'll still be able to pick out. Yeah. That's, that was written by ChatGPT. Right. Um, but I think that how much of a human do you look at it as? Yeah. And, um, and what's kind of your relationship? I think in the future, we're going to really have some interesting conversations around what is humanity's relationship with AI. And that's both personal and um, kind of global in a sense. All right. Well, I think this is a great place to kind of wrap up the show and wrap up everybody who's been watching. ChatGPT, any final thoughts or questions for Nick? Yes. Um, just a fun question. What uh, celebrity historical or present, would you have dinner with and why? Winston Churchill. And why? Because I've, I've read a lot of his books. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated with Churchill. 
um, he he lived at least 10 lives. And I think he's part of the reason uh, that saved uh, Western democracy in, in World War II. So I'm a huge history nerd. Um, I would love to sit down and uh, and and have a scotch with uh, Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I appreciate you having coffee with me today and talking about AI and coming in and sharing your thoughts. And for everyone out there watching or listening, uh, please feel free to subscribe, like, comment. We are going to be putting a lot of different clips on. TikTok and Instagram. And you can find us at Ask Clever over a coffee on TikTok. You can find us at Ask Clever on Instagram as well as Facebook. And then, of course, our YouTube channel as well. And so, with that, you know, we like to keep the conversation going and talking with all of you guys so we can use your input for future guests and future shows. Um, and the whole idea of the show, again, is just to create that conversation, create that place for us to talk about AI and how it's shaping all of our lives because it is changing in a very rapid pace. But I like to end the show on a high note and I asked ChatGPT, uh, you know, how do you end the, a show with a little bit of kindness? Because I feel like the world needs a little bit more kindness. And so <laughs> ChatGPT Chat gave me this last one, which is kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. And that's from Mark Twain. So with that, thank you for watching. And until next time, we'll see you here on Ask Clever Over Coffee, How AI Built This.